Welcome to the Landmark Theater's Q&A podcast. In this podcast, you will hear a discussion with writer-director actor Mike Birbiglia and actors Keegan-Michael Key, Tammy Sager, Kate Micucci, and Gillian Jacobs from the film Don't Think Twice with special guest moderator Seth Rogen, recorded at the Landmark in West L.A. Um, where did this come from originally? Why don't we start there? This is uh, this was an idea. I was I was um, doing an improv show at Upper Citizens Brigade Theater in New York City, and it was called Mike Birbiglia's Dream, and it was with uh, Chris <laughs> Chris Gethard and uh, I hope you were doing that show <laughs> and uh, and Tammy and and like a rotating cast of people, and I think on the on this week when the idea came up, it was like Ellie Kemper was playing with us and Aidy Bryant, like people who are around would play. Um, when they're free, and my wife made this observation once. She goes, after the show, she goes, it's it's amazing to watch this group because everyone's sort of equally talented and funny, and yet that person's a cast member in SNL, and that person's a movie star, and that person lives on an air mattress in Queens, you know? And <laughs> and I just thought, my wife is really wise, and, and uh, she always sort of says things like that that make me think a lot, and I thought, like... I could just picture that as a movie, you know. I just started, and I, and, and I was like, for for like a few weeks, I was like, I think that's a movie. Like, I think that's sort of like an ensemble movie about an improv group and about a thing where you realize that like life isn't fair. Um, and I think, think that's interesting. <laughs> it's a great idea for a comedy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, which is why it's an independent film. Um, <laughs> but I thought, like, yeah, that could be a movie. And then the thing that, for me, that made it a movie, and it's a subtle thing, but it's, I was like, how do I make the conflict of it visual? And for me, it was like the chairs metaphor of like this six chairs, and then five, and then four, and then, and then just Gillian on stage alone brilliantly at the end. You should put up your sign that says yes. <laughs> Wait for it. Thank you. That's nice. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, how many people here did improv on this stage, I guess, in some form or another? And Chris Gethard, too. Chris Gethard, yeah. Gethard. He, Chris Gethard, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess... I, from those people, what, did you have what, what were your feelings about going into making a movie about improv, and was there any trepidation on your part? And what was what were those early conversations like? I guess well, um, I, I, I first person I ran well the first people I ran it by were my wife, and then I mentioned it to Tammy and Chris because we were improv. Tammy, I noticed you guys were I believe like consultants in the credits of some yeah, uh, we sort, would, which is awesome. Yeah. We, Super nice of Mike. It was super nice of you. Oh. <laughs> like, it was one thing. It would have been enough to be in the movie. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I would have. I, I started writing the script, and then I would have these readings at my house, like where, um, like I had like ten of them, where it would be, Chris and Tammy would come and read parts, and then we'd invite. I invited you at one point, uh, and you almost came, and I had to warn you that you were. Seth Rogen as himself was the Ben Stiller part <laughs> <laughs> at one point. Um, and it was, uh, I had to warn you over email, like, hey, if you come over, just know you're in the movie <laughs> saying things you've never said. Um, and that might be weird for you, but... Uh, it's and, not really, honestly. At, at one point it was you, another point it was Keanu Reeves. And then, That's and then, the only time ever me and Keanu Reeves will ever be <laughs> <laughs> in the same role ever in a movie. So I thank you for that. <laughs> uh, you and Keanu Reeves, and then and then Ben Stiller. But um, but yeah, no, that I we I feel like we had a lot of conversations about that. It's like how do we how do we respect the art form of improv? How do you feel about Tim? Um, I was honestly I was nervous about the um, the improv showing improv part because it is. It, Always, it always looks terrible. It always is there any filmed, movie that yeah. even does it? Is there anything that well, portrays we, improv? We have not seen it or know of it. No. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I've never seen it. I, I've, I've seen it tr- attempted in a lot of TV stuff. Yeah. And it always has the feel of, uh, isn't this clever? Weren't they so great? And 
the thing that I found so brilliant about this is that you never put the audience in the audience. You made them part of us. And so it, it, it took away that judgment. It took away that moment of, hmm, I don't think it's that great. Yeah, we wanted to take away the, is it funny or is it not funny? It didn't matter. It doesn't matter. It yeah. doesn't matter. What's, the what audience thinks is, it's funny. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and the audience thinks it's funny, and so yeah. that's why we shot it with Steadicam, uh, to be essentially the seventh member of the commune. It's from the perspective of a performer on stage. And so it's really about just a friendship, which was always like, you know, people say to me like a, a lot now, like, you've made this movie about, first movie about stand, stand up, sleepwalk with me. And then you made this movie about improv. Like, what are you going to do next? Like, balloon animals or whatever. But, uh, <laughs> but I, don't, I don't even really see it as a movie about improv as yeah. much as it's a backdrop of a, of a group of friends. And, Ke Ke and when I told Ke when Keegan read the script, he was just like, we, didn't even, we had never met. We got on a Skype call. It was supposed to be 10 minutes, and we ended up talking for two hours because he was just like, you made a movie. You, you wrote a movie about my life, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and I don't know you. <laughs> Like, we got to talk. So, yeah, how does that work, and do I need to call the police? Yeah. Keeks, how do you feel about the no, improv depiction? I, I think that the depiction is good. When you said to me in that very first call, the very one of the first things he said to me was, we're going to have steady... You said to me, we're going to have steady cam, and it'll feel like the that uh, the improvisation will be will be uh, being witnessed by somebody on stage, and that intrigued me. That resonated with me, because I because you're right, Tammy, it gets real flat, and, it, and when you're watching someone on a proscenium stage, and it doesn't matter if they're making it up or if it's a play, it just doesn't look, it doesn't look appealing, and it alienates the audience. Whereas everybody, it felt almost womb-like when you, when you watch it, that everybody's involved, which is what it's supposed to be, right? It's why you go to the theater, is that we're all having the experience together. And so it, I, I feel like you accomplished that. And Fuchs was, Fuchs was our, our camera our, our operator. Camera operator. We used to call him the senator. It was every day you see Fuchs, you go, senator, doctor, <laughs> governor, <laughs> general. <You know? laughs> so, um, and he was just, he did such a tremendous job of weaving in and out of us and finding the right person to reveal at the right moment. It was just really, really. He was like 120 pounds wearing a 70 pound steady cam <laughs> in a 100 degree theater. Yeah, he was a string bean. Yeah, he was that guy made me look like Schwarzenegger. Is yeah. what he is. And Kate and Gillian, you guys had not done improv in front of a crowd before. <laughs> yes, sir. Wait, wait, had you wait, done wait, improv wait in this, front of a crowd for before? This. Gillian's you heard gonna, about this. Gillian's gonna tell you that. No. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> She and Kate, had you you would never had? No, no, I, I took I did the one oh one at UCB like ten years ago or something. I didn't yeah. I like it didn't I guess I just went on the, the Garfunkel and Oats, Oats Road after that. So like I didn't really continue with classes. So I felt super like I didn't know what the heck I was doing at all. And but then I looked at Gillian and I was like, Oh great, we're in this together. <laughs> cool. Um but Gillian is I'm just gonna say really nice things now, but I know you can't talk, so. Um. She can't say no, no, I'm not. She has to thank you card it. ready. Yeah. This is actually like in a great opportunity to just say whatever we Gillian, want about Gillian right? because yeah. she hates compliments so much. She hates them like it's like hitting her with a poison dart. If you want to end the conversation with Gillian Jacobs, start complimenting her. <laughs> well, I'll just gonna, I'm gonna start, but um, no, Gillian truly is one of the the smartest, most talented people. So so she took off running with with improv, and and I I take a it takes a long time for me to like for things to sink in. So I was like, oh oh, there goes my friend, because <laughs> because I mean I it's to, I, I I learned along the way, but in the beginning, I mean you just picked it up so fast. What, so when you felt was it actually? I mean we haven't talked about this at all, so I'm just was it actually improvised what you were doing, or it was, was it this, written? The scenes were written, and then um, the scenes were written, and then when we were in those costume changes. We would film about ten minutes of actual improv with Steadicam, which, yeah. to my knowledge, hasn't been done. And so there's like moments, like Gillian has like some of the best moments in the film improvised, which is amazing because she had just learned it three weeks before and had never done it before. But there's that line where she says the 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 last drop of a man's blood is the sweetest nectar you'll ever taste. That was in Gillian's brain. <laughs> 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 That was something she was thinking about and hadn't told us. And there's and she a shared it at the right moment. Yeah. When you guys see this film again, I want you to watch uh, Chris Gethard's face on stage because he just goes. 
That's but like it was a of... moment of pride for Chris. Oh, it's he was like, pride. oh, our baby has flown. Our bird has flown because she just, like, it just pulled out of nowhere. We love you, and you're so good. <laughs> you're just doing you're just, so it's like great. You're just a genius who just you're picks things up so easily. Oh my god! And you're beautiful. We can't even believe it. We're, they're in shock. <laughs> <laughs> this is very weird for us, too. <laughs> by the way. <laughs> It's funny. I like, I enjoy this. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, I mean, so in. <laughs> stop. She had that one at the ready. Yeah. You she said, had a lot of presumptuous things written down. There was, she you already said, had thank you. You, you said, you said, <laughs> <laughs> you said stop, actually. I remember, no, you, see? <laughs> I remember we did like a nine minute Hepburn take that finally I called cut on. Because a lot of times I like to just roll. So that, like, it after a while, it just doesn't feel like you're acting. Like, it's just like, oh, I'm just doing Hepburn alone, and like, just on on a, in a cycle. And uh, and then eventually, I called God, and you're like, thank you, <laughs> you know. But it ended up being like one of my favorite scenes in the movie. Wait, we have a personalized this. message coming. <laughs> We're straying from the script. Oh. In the true theme of the evening, what is it? I thought I was I, doing a bad. I Wait, do I was your doing Gillian impression. Job. Do your Gillian impression. Um, well, right now, I'll do my Gillian impression of right now. I thought I was doing a bad job. <laughs> no, I thought I was doing a bad job, and that's why we kept rolling. Oh. No. Because no. it was so good. Gil, you know, no notes are good notes. <laughs> that's right. So how much, so do you... Do that you was improv- Gillian's idea for a clip, though, actually. We had, I had was written the out another impression in the script, and, and at one point... I was like, is there any impression you want to do? <laughs> he was like, I could do like Hepburn. And then she showed me this clip. And I was like, I asked Amanda, who's Martin Marshall, one of our producers, who's here tonight. I be- wait, I believe. No, not uh, here. Uh, I sent her out she's of She's had a baby. <laughs> I take it back. She had a baby today. That's right. I she, was uh, I think she did wrong. have a baby today. I was very wrong about that. Yeah. She did. Um, but I asked about if we could license that clip. And then we did. And so that was a cool time. But there's a lot of things like, in terms of like improv. Do you improvise a like, lot throughout the filming itself uh, in the movie about I, the improv? How would you describe it, Tim? Like, I, I like people to say things in their own word, whatever yeah. feels right. Like, say the script or whatever. Something feels to that effect. Like, you, yeah, feels like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was. How do you, no, you how did. Do you no, do yeah. That? Because you would, you would say the, the only thing that was obviously important, the, the most important, not the only thing, the most important thing was that we were moving the story forward. So yeah. there would be places where you'd say, if that's not feeling right, and you have a very good instinct, Mike, about saying, ah, that doesn't, I can see that doesn't feel right in their. In their mouth, it does. They're, 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 it they're stuttering feel, over yeah, it, right? Yeah. And so you'd say, okay, just, just, just do what you want. But you were very good at saying, but we got to hit these benchmarks yeah. to make sure that we can move to the next scene. And so we could say whatever we wanted as long as we got to that to that place at the end of the scene. But then I think in the edit, very, very often, sometimes we would relax, and there'd be a couple of times. It was interesting, Seth. There'd be a couple of times where he'd say, "No, let it breathe. Do what you want. Do what you want." And then the next take, say the lines again. Yeah. And then you, we would get it the yeah. way you want. It, it just we we got comfortable with the meaning. Then we could say your words, and it was great. And then surprisingly, he always used the take with his words. It's interesting. <laughs> it's really I interesting. In, he I was he in, used <laughs> your words as just a roundabout way to achieve his, his own words, in right. a better way. I mean, I've been told by my friends who act with me while I'm directing that they don't like it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> very bluntly, I've noticed some of my friends just will not take direction from me if I'm in the scene oh with God. them, and I have to get my partner to give them direction. That, um, Seth, you can't. I can't tell you how happy that makes me. <laughs> just so, the shot and see you on set going, yeah. you're not going to go, Evan! No, yeah, it was literally like, oh, I would just clue into it. I would just be like, he never listens to me. If it comes from me, I would tell Evan, like, pretend Evan. you have this note <laughs> right? and go tell him that it's, he's doing this it weird. It makes me so happy to hear that, by the way, because I, I'm constantly asked in press, like, who am I jealous of? And I always am like, I don't know if I'm jealous of one particular person. I realize it's you. Um, and so hearing you, like, what? Like when, I saw this, like when my wife and I saw this is the end at the, in the theater, like I laughed so hard and I was like, 
how the fuck did he direct that? Like, how, <laughs> how, how, how on earth did that? It's just, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's like infuriatingly good. And so to hear you. That, I use my friend to manipulate he all makes my other Evan friends. Evan do all the work. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's, but, that's very comforting. And Franco has said to me, to my face, that when I'm directing, I'm not nearly as in the scene with him as I am if I'm not directing. And I can't. Lie. Can't I refute can't, that. I have to. I can't refute it because it's true. Because I'm literally like focusing on that. The fact that like the Steadicam guy's walking at a speed that I know <laughs> I will find yeah. unusable, and so uh, I'm just like, none of this works. The guy's going too fucking fast. It doesn't matter. And so I guess this is a question for everyone other the, the, than Mike. Honestly, <laughs> in that, did you what did what was your experience acting with someone who was also the director? Was it ever annoying? Was it ever weird? Did you ever find that he was not maybe as present as? Did you ever find one job maybe superseding the other at times? <laughs> 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 because, because my friends have told me that yes, it, it, it in fact does happen the, quite a bit. The interesting thing is when he's when he first of all very nurturing when he's not on set. If he's behind, if he's at the monitor, fantastic. And then on set, the only difference was that we never is that you didn't get to have the fun that we were having because he was clearly someplace else right before he'd say action. And then remember the dog. The dog was the craziest thing, Tam. Right? We're we're in the East. We were in the East Village or the Lower East Side, in New York City, and there was like a dog, a man who had clearly found some way to put a collar and a leash on a feral dog, <laughs> and he walked into a magazine shop and left this dog sitting on top of a newspaper dispenser, and, and Tammy and I are looking at this it dog. Was it was tiny... on a newspaper dispenser. <laughs> a dog. Imagine that picture, and, like in the air. And if any of you knows dogs whatsoever, you know that the smaller they are, the more terrified they are. And they will, that dog was basically screaming in dog language, everybody fuck off, don't even look at me. <laughs> like it had crazy in its eye. But and Mike I, I, was so wrapped up in what was happening with every single other aspect of the film that he came outside and just saw the dog and he was just like, hey dog, and he ran right over to the dog. <laughs> Mike just almost bit his nose off. And we were like, Mike! And he said, I, guys, guys, I've got like 7,000 things going on in my brain. No. But when he's acting with you, it's never... I but when he's acting with you, he's present. It's, he's present. But also, I think it's because it's, it's, you, 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 because you wrote it and, and you... There were like 15 drafts of this script and, and had done 10 table reads. It was so in your marrow, I felt that you could turn that switch off. I mean, Fra James is a hard on. He He's a dick. James is yeah. a dick. <laughs> He's, a, <laughs> He's a, Franco, a total dick. Everything's always, it's got to be perfect and blah, blah. Stop doing 18 projects. No, I noticed it myself. No, it's because I noticed myself doing it. Yeah. Do you notice yourself doing it, Mike? Is there any moment where. Doing what? Be, being distracted as you're supposed when you're, to be when, acting. When you're acting. By a director thing. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I think that's part of it. I think yeah. I actually talked to Ben Stiller about it once, where I, I fuck, um, he's good at that too. Shit. <laughs> I know he does it. He does it too. And, uh, I go, how do you do it? And he goes, you just have to level with your actors at the start of the process and just say, look, this is my vision. And so, like, and and, and so the fact that I'm an actor, like, in some ways, it slows down the process and it's a little bit of pain in the ass. But if you're like, if you're you're willing to roll with it, like. I think this could be a pretty amazing film, and and so I, I think that that I feel like did I do you feel like I leveled you did you, guys about you that did Mike, but also or? the other thing that you did is that you had worked on the script for so long you had distilled it down to exactly what it needed to be, and so the, I, I think so we were all yeah. we all drank the Kool Aid immediately because the thing is by the time he had gotten to the thirteenth or fourteenth draft of this thing it was already an A plus and then we signed on. You know what I mean? Like you can't. What, what's the Clooney thing? What's the Clooney oh, thing? Oh, I, I I love that Clooney says this thing, which is like if the script isn't there, like you won't have a movie. Like if the like you a great just, actor you can't won't. fix it. Yeah, you can't yeah. fix a bad script. Yeah. I just want to tell like four other examples of Mike being crazy because yeah, he yeah, was yeah, do it. Go for it. Or if, let's start with an example of like he did a nice job on this. Just sort of, <laughs> you know, just sort of balance it out. <laughs> Make me feel okay about it, and oh, then he did uh, an amazing of... job with casting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, he, uh, I'll, I'll, two 
quick ones. One is Gillian's favorite, which is we were filming. This is we were stealing a bunch of the subway footage, believe it or not. <laughs> All of that was stolen. And uh, we got out of a van, and he walked up to a, a, a clearly insane woman who was holding a doll like a baby. <laughs> and he just went up to her, and he went, that's not a baby. That's a doll. There's no, she, she wasn't coming up to us. <laughs> You you went into her. You invaded uh, her fantasy. Yeah, no, you no. went into her reality. Look, that crazy Hind- lady thought, "Whoa, I- this dude's crazy." <laughs> Hindsight's twenty twenty on me informing the woman that the the doll she was holding wasn't a baby. You guys are right. It's maybe not the best answer to Seth's question. <laughs> I just mean that. I disagree. Me <laughs> distracted because of all the things he had to do as a director yeah. would come up, it would rear its head. Um, but also, I think what was interesting, too, was his character was kind of a dick. So he would... So it was easy to play. <laughs> <laughs> but he would just sometimes just be... it. Like, when we'd be improvising, he would just be a dick. And so you'd be like, fuck, real dick there. But then yeah. he'd be like, no, I'm just in character. <laughs> It's true. That's why I played the part. I mean, Yorma Takone, who you know, is yeah. a great director and writer, and, and he goes, he early on was like, you should play the part of Jack, Keegan's part. And, and I wasn't being f- falsely modest. I was like, I'm not talented enough to play Jack. <laughs> like, I, it needs to be somebody who's like, you look at him and you go, that guy should get everything. Like, that guy should be able to do anything. Um, and that's why I was so lucky that Keegan was into doing it because I think the moment he comes on screen, you just go, yeah. And uh, and and with, and and with with me, like with Miles, it's like it's an easy part to play because I'm just I'm just bitter. And, uh, <laughs> and if you know me at all, uh, I'm a little bitter in life as well. I got a little part of me in there. The question is, do you sell out or stick to your guns, Mike? <laughs> Stick to your guns. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I feel lucky that I was able to work with uh, Miranda Bailey, who's here tonight, one of our producers, brilliant Where's producer. Where's Miranda? She did some... Uh, I think she's here. I'm almost sure of it. Miranda, Miranda's also not here. Okay. Oh, maybe she'll be at the second screening tonight. Um, but, she, but, uh, but, you know, Cold Iron Pictures, you know, was r- really wanted to support the vision I had for this film, and so we probably made it for a lesser budget than a studio would have made it for uh, by about, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'd say maybe a t- roughly a tenth of the budget a studio would have spent. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. I think, yeah, I, 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 I think you have to do what you love and you have to, because otherwise sort of what's the point? Like we're all gonna be dead in 30 years. <laughs> Michael. That's how I feel about it. All I right, really answer, we'll all be dead. Next question. <laughs> Anyone ever stupidly vouched for a friend? I, yeah. I've, I, I, oh, I've, yeah, I've done it. I've done it, too, oh, and I've, I've done been it. burned, I know too. Tammy's done it. I, Tammy. I, I remember I, was, I, I got just like a friend, an internship once at early in my career, like at uh, the Carson Daly show in, uh, she, when it was in New York, and she... Like just stop showing up to it, and oh. and then it's like that's on me, you know. And it was it's rough. I mean, oh, yeah. you really have to when you vouch for someone, you really have to like sort of vouch for them whole in a, in a holistic well, way. It, it is holistic, yeah. And I've done the same thing where I had a writing partner and I vouched for them, and then we had a project set up, and then then all of a sudden, like that guy's lawyer was asking for money that even that I wasn't getting on the project. <laughs> oh. And then somebody had to call somebody else at an agent and say, this guy, we wouldn't have even done this thing if, you know, if, like if Keegan wasn't involved. And, and, and then like, we should fire him. And, and then you have, to have that, you have to have that conversation where you go, you're not behaving well. And, and now we have to sever, we well, have that's to sever ties. That's, you know, I'm still mad you fired me off that film. But. <laughs> And I did deserve <laughs> everything. <laughs> Tam, you were going to say something. Too. Oh, the, the worst one I did, but it was really on me. I was interviewing. I just started out, and I was a writer at Mad TV for like a few months. God bless you. That's okay. And uh, 
I think that's about the response then. <laughs> I love that I'm like, shh. All right, take it easy. We've only got 10 minutes. <laughs> But I, I had um, an interview or some like sketch comedy thing, and it was one of those things where they had realized like, oh, everybody involved so far is a woman, so well, let's meet some funny ladies. And so I went in, and the woman was like, it's so great meeting a female comedy writer, um, and uh, she's like, it's so hard to find. And I just went, oh my god, I have so many. I know so many. Let me give you a bunch of names, which. Partly is like, yes, I'm being generous, but also it came from a place of total, like, don't, I don't deserve this. And it didn't play well. It, I don't think she looked at those names and then called them. It just sort of became like, what are you doing? And I was like, literally took out a sheet of paper and wrote down 10 names. Oh, yeah. And we do, and we do it out of fear because we want those people to like us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, who here has taught improv in some capacity? Keegan, Tammy, a little bit freelance. <laughs> and Gethard, and, and Gethard has a lot. And Gethard's taught a lot. Yeah. Yeah, he's uh, like one of the probably most like a, like a premier teacher in yeah. the improv so world. Definitely, definitely. Um, yeah. Um, it's 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 a sense of I mean, for me, I I was. I was a horrible, horrible teacher at, at first because what I horrible because what so I used to do is I would, students. What's that, honey? No. I, <laughs> <laughs> he never did. <laughs> I, that character is based on me. No, I. It's not. It is not. I. Um. I was. I found myself. I found myself performing for my students, and not teaching them something. And and then finally, as I got older and older and older, you have to realize you, you've 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 kind of in a manner metaphorically in a manner of speaking, you've got to pray to this god of improv, and you have to be a priest to the god. You can't. It's not you. It's it's these tenets that somebody else set up decades and decades before. But so I think that I I had to start bowing down to that knowledge that was not mine. I'm just, I'm just here to try to give it to other people as clearly as I possibly can and as succinctly as I possibly can. But it took me a while to get to that, that place. I, I, I mean, I can't speak for you, Tammy, or, or Chris, but it, it's, it, you, once you start to really respect the art form, you can become a better teacher at it. Cause, and, and, but, but the hardest part, which Viola Spolin used to do, Viola Spolin, who's the, the grandmother of all improv, she used to teach these workshops, and it was amazing because you did all the work. The student discovered, she would kind of set things out and back up and let you experientially work through it and have your own personal revelations. And that's the, you know, like the deepest kind of teaching. So. Yeah, my father's an amazing math teacher. He actually now teaches math teachers how to teach math. And his big thing is always, uh, listen, the, mo the thing that students want most is to be listened to. And so that also helps you. If you're listening, instead of thinking of the smart thing you're going to say, then you're already doing better. As an improviser, I'm just wondering of uh, your, your best advice for someone who's trying to use it to be successful. I, 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 we've been traveling around the country, uh, me and Liz Allen, who actually taught us improv and coached the, us as the commune. Um, she's been teaching improv workshops, and then I talked to the uh, the group about how improv principles relate to directing and, and writing and acting. And I feel like, you know, what you said, you know, listening is very key. The thing about improv principles are like the stuff at the beginning, say yes, and it's all about the group, and um, and don't think. Actually, apply, I think, to sort of all artistic disciplines in a really positive way. Like even as a writer, like alone, like writing this in a coffee shop at like seven in the morning, a lot of it is like saying yes to yourself and, and saying yes and not holding back thoughts that come into your head and judging them and saying like that's stupid or people are gonna think that I'm like an idiot for writing that on the page and just kind of like blurting out. I don't know if you find that Seth when you're writing a first draft of something, it's kind of embarrassing. Yes, sometimes our finished product is embarrassing. So. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I think it, I think those principles really apply to to all all, all of those disciplines. <laughs> uh, all right, on that note, thank you guys thank so you, much, everyone. Tell your friends, thank you. You have been watching the Landmark Theaters Q and A podcast. For further in-depth discussions with filmmakers, be sure to check out the other Q&As available on our channel from past films. And remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel to stay up to date with all our bonus content. Thanks for watching.